I'm Michael Deitch. I'm an artist here at Anton Center. Um, I've been weaving for about 45 years. I have my own studio in my home in Lathrop Village. It's called Cody Many Color Hand Weavers. And I am also a craft weaver and I'm a Judaic weaver. I weave and teach weaving to um, Jewish bar mitzvah kids, pre and bar mitzvah kids who weave their own palaces for their bar mitzvahs. So I do that a lot. And in the last 15 years, we've over got 400 taluses with families for their children. So today I'm here to be demonstrating how to weave a scarf. I brought several scarves with me you can look at, and I brought several talit to look at. So basically weaving is a fiber art. And as far as I'm concerned, if we didn't have weavers, everybody would be naked. Well, weaving humor. So anyway, so I sat home and I do a lot of scarves and with this virus, I've been home for like six months weaving everything in my house. So basically what it is, is you plan out your weaving and then you warp it out on a warping board, which is a big pegboard and it's, everything is by the yard. And then we plan it out. This is a seven inch wide scarf and we warp it out and we've the set or the thickness density of the um, fabric is 12 threads per inch. So I warped out 80 threads, I bundled them up, I put them on the loom, I wound it on, I threaded them through my heddles and through my reed, and then I tied it on to my warp beam, and then I started weaving, and I do production weaving, so I do like two or four scarves at a time, which are the same. So what we do is when we start, we initially do about three inches, then we put a hem stitch into the warp, attaching the warp, your, the towel, the prayer, the pressure, the scarf you're weaving to the fabric, and then we weave the fabric. So when you're weaving, the threads that go horizontal are called the warp threads, okay? Nothing to do with Star Trek. And the shuttle is called the weft. These are English terms. So basically, how this loom is set up is a basic weave, which is even odd, even odd, even odd. So when I threaded the heddles, I threaded the threads through one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, all the way across the seven inches. So there are certain things you have to know about a loom. This is a floor loom. It's a portable floor loom. It actually folds up and travels. Okay, so the basic parts are, this is the warp, this is going to be the weft, this is the yarn on the shuttle, and this is the shuttle. And then we have treadles on the floor, which we press up and down, which raise the harnesses. And the way, this, this is like a mini computer in a funny way. When you step on the first treadle, it picks up the odd threads. When you step on the second treadle, it picks up the even threads. So it's Instead of having to do like on a rigid loom where you go in and out, in and out, in and out, like you're doing a rug or a pillow, this kind of manipulates it for you. And funny, in the 1700s, a famous um, weaver named Jacquard in France invented a very complicated loom that worked like an IBM loom with the punch cards. He had made a conveyor belt along the top of the loom and he put pegs in the harnesses, and when you stepped on the treadles, they would go through the pedals, the, I mean the um, card, the wooden card, and it would set the pattern. So they've gotten away from that. So this is more a very physical thing. So this is a four harness loom with six treadles, and you can do a lot of different patterns. There's like a million things you can weave on it, but we're doing a very simple, plain weave. So. On the harnesses are these little heddles we threaded through, and that gives it its tension and its evenness, and it sets the warp up, okay? So the most important part about warping a loom is the tension you put into the weft. You don't want the corners to pull in, you don't want them to go out. So it's kind of tight, it happens to like a very tight warp, okay? So when we step on the harnesses below, Usually we step on two, which picks up the even threads first, I do. Then we take the shuttle with the yarn attached, 
and we always have the yarn at the end, like a tail, and we slip it through the shed. The shed is a space between the threads. We pull it through, and the longer you weave, the easier the tension gets. You don't want to pull it in, you don't want to let it loose. So we put the, the, war, the warp in, and we leave a little, we don't put straight in, we leave a little curve in it. So when we beat it down, this is a beater, we beat it down firmly, and it locks the thread in place. Okay, so it's, then we step on number one, and it brings up the odd threads, one and three, and we do the same thing. So it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay, so when you get good at weaving and comfortable, it's more has a zen quality to weaving. It's very relaxing, especially when you're doing something so repetitive and you're only pressing a couple of treadles down. Okay. So this is basically how you weave back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And you can feel the tension in your wrist when you pull it through. You don't want to pull it tight. It just has a snug tension. So as we weave along, we creep up the warp. And then we get to a certain point, we have to advance the warp. There's 14 feet of yarn on here. The warp's 14 feet long, so I can weave two six-foot scarves. And when I come to doing my next scarf, I put, I do a hem stitch, locking it in place. And then usually on my scarves, I leave a little fringe. So I put one of my shuttles in, and then I weave a couple of shots, they're also called shots, back and forth. And then I pull the space, it's really a spacer, and I put it again up at the top. And then, oops, let me start again. I'm going to start a second scarf. Oops, let me move this warp up a little. So we have a break in the back, and it releases the warp to come forward. And gently, I step on the break and advance the warp. And I adjust the tension, so it's pretty tight. You have to make that up. That's the whole art process when you're weaving. It's your design, so the warp is what you think it is. You can change threads in the weft. You can leave it solid. You can pull threads out, like they can give it a little texture on the top. You can loop it up, make it a little different kind of texture. You can change colors. If you can think of it, you can do it, but you always got to lock the threads in. Okay, so to start the second one, I'm going to leave a little tail. I need some space to make another warp, make another hem stitch so I can lock second piece, and I start weaving. So I do about 30 shots. What's your favorite um, thread to work with? Or you, work with? you know, I've been using a lot, a lot of um, rayon, okay. a lot of rayon. All these scarves are all rayon, rayon ribbon and rayon. It's kind of... It is easy to work with. When you work with like wool, it's kind of stretchy. Okay. And if you work, nobody weaves in silk, usually mix a silk mixture with something. But then cotton is pretty strong too. You have to be careful, like knitting yarns are hard to work with because for a reason they're kind of stretchy. So I just kind of stay away from them. Another part is, since I'm a Judaic weaver, there's actually rules, kosher rules, to fibers. Okay. The, the rule is you can't mix linen with anything. You can weave in linen, but you can't mix it. You can mix it. You can mix it with rayon, but you can't mix it with any natural fiber. It's one of the kosher laws. So when I weave my talit, I don't use any um, linen at all. I don't keep any in my studio. It makes it easier. The art center? Uh -huh. You really want to know? Yeah. 18? Good. I was here when Joanne was here. It's nice to do that. So I've been here for a long time. I'm teaching here that long too. Because I teach like in this fall and spring, I teach like four, 
four months in the fall and four months in the spring I teach here. And I have two students, and I, I bring a loom just like this. I have four of these. And it's all warped, and I kind of pick nice colors, and I've been doing um, ribbon scarves. And it's, I don't teach them to actually thread the loom. That would take forever. And then that's something you learn separately. And then we just weave a, it's a project oriented. So in about two hours, they have a scarf. It's kind of nice. They get to take it right home. So I've been doing that. And then when I teach my talus weaving, I basically do the same thing, except the warp is about 20 inches wide. And I have the 12 year old, 13 year old student weave their own talus, and that takes them about three hours. They come here, I bring like millions of colors of yarn. They design it, and we execute it. It takes about three hours, and the whole family gets to take a turn in it, too. And sometimes we have um, clients here weaving. Sometimes their family members come, and I give everybody a chance. And usually, every, for the last 13 years, I've been the guest artist at the Detroit Institute of Art during the winter. And what I do is I bring two of these looms and they're kind of facing each other and I, we do an open studio, usually in Rivera Court, which is really cool. And anybody, visitor can sit down and weave for 10 minutes. So whoever gets it, nobody gets a chance to weave. So it's really a good experience. You know, and usually I end up giving away scarves to some of the clientele, it's kind of cute. So it's, it's really like a lot of fun. So I like sharing the art of weaving. Nobody does it, hardly. I belong to a guild. I'm like the only one who goes out and teaches in public. I do a lot of demonstrations. In the early 2000s, I used to do a lot of art shows. But it's kind of funny trying to sell fibers during the summer and spring. It's like do things ahead to winter and fall. So, but we did that for a long time. We used to do really good. We always, we always got an honorable mention. We used to do all the shows up and down the river, the, you know, from, from Port York and down to Wyandotte. And then over to Flint and Midland. So I, Ann Arbor, we never did. Nobody I had the patience for that. <laughs> so I do that. And I've been teaching in Port Yard. I teach at the Jewish Center in their Cherrick Gallery. And I used to teach in the Wyandotte Gallery. But my favorite gallery is the Anton Center. Cause, you know, it's just a nice place. And we have a really good clientele here. So. What do you miss about being at the art party this year? No, we said, you can't talk to anybody. It's kind of hard. That's always a highlight for the gallery every year. And the artist's market's always a lot of fun. I can't tell you how much stuff I have in my house from the, art, from the holiday party. So basically, that's weaving. It's something that's hands-on. It's very rewarding. And you, believe it or not, it's not a lot of mess. Like painting and jewelry and sculptures. Pottery, it's messy. This you get to do a project. You can come back and forth and take your time doing it, or you can weave it all at once. And you have instant gratification. That's the best part. It's really a lot of fun. And since we've had this epidemic going, I've woven everything in my studio like twice. So I've got like 200 and something scarves floating around. <laughs> so, Where do you get your inspiration for your scarves? Well, on these special taluses here, they're going in an interface show in Bir Birmingham online. I happen to like 60s art. I like big colors. So these are like big colors. You know, I, when we hang them, I, they're going to be full length. And when you wear them, they're really beautiful. Um, you know, and I have a minor in art history, so I know a lot about colors, how to use them. You know, you know, I'm a game to anything. I get a lot of inspiration at the DIA when I'm down there. I spend a lot of time down there. And, um, you know, talking to other artists. And I belong to a guild. And, you know, we inter interchange with each other and talk to each other. And what else? Any other questions? Any other questions? <laughs> she didn't lie. So basically, that's how you weave. It's really, once you get the science of it down and the technique, it's very easy. And you have to remember that this weaving on a loom like this probably happened in the 12th or 13th century and came up. And it really hasn't changed at all. It's just become a little more mechanical. And that you have to realize, too, that every village in the world had weavers, but nobody would have clothes. What started you wanting to weave? Well, I took a class in undergrad at Eastern. 
And then I had bought a beautiful handcraft, big handcrafted loom, and I was wanting to learn more. I learned to weave better when I was living in Ann Arbor. They used to have a really good um, weaving studio in Kerrytown called the Wild West. And the teachers were great. And then I had moved to Columbus, Ohio, when I went, I decided to get my MFA in education and in weaving, and I had a, the world's greatest weaving instructor. Clara Krieger was like the greatest. And she, said I was, she thought I was really good, which was a lot. And she taught me a lot. And she showed me how to use really big looms and how to get through everything. And yeah, believe it or not, there wasn't a lot of pressure. She was a really, a really, really good teacher and a good educator. And that's how I got interested. And then in the early 2000s, a friend of mine wanted to learn, had retired, and was bored to death. And I said, why don't we start an art studio? He said, yeah. he said, I didn't have a loom at the time. He said, you guys would be a really no, good weaver. So he and he had been a nurse. He had been my life partner. And he said, let's start a studio. So I had him trained by some friends in Northville. And it was a miracle. It was like a duck to water. He was just a fabulous weaver. He could weave chenille like God. And we did a lot of art shows, the two of us. I mean, a lot. We slept a loom with us all the time. We did demos at all the art shows. It was a lot of fun, you know, and he was more a technician than designer. So basically, we decided the colors. We were doing a lot of chenille work. And we used to make trips to Massachusetts to the big yard mill by a lot of chenille. And we spent the summers and springs weaving it all and selling it. It was really fun. So then when he passed away, I just continued the business and then I'd been working for the Jewish Federation in Detroit, and they had a really good education department. And one of the head of the education department was a friend of mine, and she was a big client. And she goes, why don't you do something Judaic? I said, like what? She goes, weave taluses. I said, ooh. So I knew all the rabbis. So I went around town, consulted everybody, learned all the ins and outs. Um, I got eight Umungo grants from the Federation. And when we did the, we made, we made like, in four years we made like 120 taluses in the synagogues with all the kids for their bar mitzvahs, which was really cool. And then about a couple of years later, Harleen started again. She goes, I have a job for you. She goes, what? How much vacation time do you have? I said, lots. She goes, I want you to go to Camp Ramon in Georgia. And they have a special needs camp for autistic children. Why don't you teach weaving? I said, really? She goes, yeah, they're going to pay you really well. <laughs> so, I, so the first time we went, we took four of these. We rented a Yule, and we took four of these. And we went, and it was family camp, which was a week before camp started and a week after camp started. And we went down, and we had like a captive audience of like 20 families. Everybody wove, from three-year-olds to 90-year-olds. It was a hoot. And we taught, everybody had to weave. We were making like hollow covers and little bags and placemats. And um, it was a lot of fun. We did that for three years. And then we had one very, very special child. And his mom, it was the beginning of the summer. And he was severely autistic. And his parents commissioned me to weave a talus. For him. We had the bar mitzvah in August. So we come back and we had the bar mitzvah in camp. So they gave me the parameters, and we talked to the child, and he picked the colors, and I went home and wove it. And when I, I went to um, the head of the camp, was a conservative rabbi, and he said, this is going to be a special talus. And usually, when you weave a talus, you leave spaces between the stripes. And I said, I have a great idea. I need a rabbinical dispensation. It's like going to the Pope. And I said, can I put, you're not supposed to be graven images in anything. I said, this is a special talus. I'm going to put images into the talus. He goes, how so? I said, I'm going to have them transferred to cotton blocks. So over the summer, the family he sent me all these pictures. He had a service dog he was with. He did a lot of creative things in the school and with his family. We took the pictures. They had them all transferred to a piece of cotton. And they put a dozen pictures into the talus. Then we came back at the end of the summer. And we had his bar mitzvah. And when I got there, the father couldn't wait to see me because we, we had been corresponding. And he looked at me and he started crying. And so that was the end of that. 
And then we had his bar mitzvah in camp. It was kind of um, a simple bar mitzvah. And we had the whole camp crying. It was just a really, really special moment. So, and you'd be surprised. Weaving's always been used as therapeutic. It means for people with, when they had um, the tuberculosis hospitals, people wove. A lot of physical therapy at one time. I know when I went to Eastern, they used to have a studio that physical therapists taught children with knee special needs to weave. That's where I got the idea. They don't do it anymore. But I picked up on the idea, and then I was affiliated with Temple Israel, and one of the families gave me a grant for a few years, and we did like six kids a year came, and we wove taluses with them in a temple. It was really special. And the Bar Mitzvahs were really special because these kids wove their own taluses. You know, it was any rush. It took like two sessions. So it was really cool. Mm -hmm.